Hi, I'm Adam Holman, but you might know me as the Cottage Coach. In this episode, we're scratching an itch that drives cottagers up the wall. Mosquitoes. I honestly can't think of anything worse than lying in bed at night with the lights off and hearing that sound. So, to get to the bottom of why they bite, why they breed, and what we can do to keep them at bay, we're talking with Dr. Jean-Paul Paluzzi, who studies blood-feeding arthropods, better known in our neck of the woods as mosquitoes and ticks. We've also got some tips on cleaning up the most common mosquito breeding grounds on your cottage property, and we'll decide whether the mosquito deserves the title, The Most Annoying Cottage Bug. This is the Cottage Life Podcast, where every day is... Sorry, where every day is the... All right, who left the screen door open? One sec, I gotta take care of this. Luckily, this episode is brought to you by Off, so I've got plenty of repellent on hand. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. This is a special bonus episode of the Cottage Life Podcast, presented by Off, where every day is the weekend. We don't get many summer weekends in Canada, so we need to embrace every single one of them. That means my family and I get outside no matter what. Whether the sky is grey, or the wind off the lake is chilly, or even when the mosquitoes are biting. But before we head outside, we need a reliable bug repellent. That's where Off Family Care comes in. It's deep-free and easy to apply, and it repels mosquitoes for up to five hours. Plus, its new formula dries on contact, so it doesn't feel oily or greasy. Try it, and you'll have one more great reason to embrace the outdoors every summer weekend. Sunny days, bright skies, and calm waters are all part of why we love summers at the cottage. But being outdoors also means dealing with the pesky buzz of biting insects. Something Dr. Jean-Paul Paluzzi knows all about. The associate professor in biology at York University specializes in mosquitoes, among other blood-feeding arthropods. Dr. Paluzzi, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. So I get this a lot around the campfire from friends, from kids. What is the role of mosquitoes? Other than to bug us, I mean, do we really need them around? So we ourselves uh, directly don't need them. But, uh, you know, the uh, juvenile, the the offspring and the larva ultimately of mosquitoes are an important uh, food source for a number of other species, whether they're avian species uh, fishes, et cetera. So they're certainly a really important, uh, component of the ecosystem in an, you know, an array of different environments, uh, in Canada. And of course, across the globe. Is there a specific, um, animal that really loves mosquitoes? Would that be their first choice? You know, most, uh, small juvenile fishes, they're going to be feeding on anything that they can get their, uh, would say their hands on, but they can get to and they have available in their habitat. And, you know, larval insects are a really easy uh, food source for them in that uh, they can easily acquire them. Um, But the same holds true for, you know, in in many urban environments, even suburban environments where we have uh, larval mosquitoes and bird baths, for example, um, those can be a very uh, easy food source for um, uh, many bird species, right? They don't really have to forage, just go to the bird bath, get wet, and they can feed on those uh, larvae as well. Let's talk about the mosquito season a little bit. Um, When is the worst time? How long does it last? Yeah, so uh, mosquitoes uh, generally um, in in Canada uh, up until just a few years ago had a a relatively uh, short uh, duration, you know, given our, our relatively cooler climate. But of course, with climate change, everything's changing. And certainly there has been an expansion of the season where we can find mosquitoes. So certainly, um, I know many people have found them as early as late April, um, but it, May is not unheard of. Uh, it used to be June, 
uh, to about August, but certainly uh, many of these species are actually thriving well into uh, su late September because, of course, it's much warmer in September, September than it used to be. So do you think it will continue to get worse? Yeah, I guess it depends uh, really on uh, the extent to how much change there is. Um, you know, we have seen uh, over the last few decades um, about a 10% increase in the number of mosquito species. Uh, there were about 70 or so in, in Canada. Um, and over the last few decades, there's been about eight to nine uh, that have been uh, invasive that have been added uh, coming from other areas of the globe. Um, simply because, you know, the habitat where we find ourselves is now suitable for these animals to thrive. And so um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to really forecast that because, of course, um, not only are we getting increasing temperatures, but it's a lot more variable, uh, the climate, right? You know, one season we can have a very dry season, um, whereas another season can be very wet. And that has a, a, a very huge impact on um, how mosquitoes uh, and particular species will survive. Some are more susceptible to the heat, some are less susceptible, some need more water, uh, others less water. So it's really dependent on the species. But um, if we continue certainly uh, maintaining this extended heat, you know, a longer summer season, we will have to get used to having these mosquitoes around. Um, let's talk about the breeding a little bit. Uh, when does it happen in the season? Um, is there any way that we can prevent it in our backyards, in our cottages? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, this really depends a lot on your immediate environment, right? In an urban and suburban environment where there's a lot less trees um, and a lot less area for these petite mosquitoes to, to, to breed, right? The, the larval are aquatic and they require a, a water environment to survive and to grow. And then it's just the adults that are terrestrial that are uh, emerge and fly around. And it's only the females that actually blood feed. The males don't do anything except for mate with the female and then they die. And they actually live a very short amount of time once they emerge. Um, and so to get rid of mosquitoes, at least in an urban environment and suburban environment, we can help by you know, making sure that we're removing any sitting water, uh, whether that be bird baths or any buckets or tires that you have in and around your property. You know, just a, a, a heavy rainfall filling those containers up can, you know, create a breeding ground for hundreds, if not thousands of, of larvae um, if a, a female mosquito has blood fed and then lays her eggs in that uh, water pool. So you don't have to do it every single day because these animals do require at least a week and a half to two weeks to actually reach the adult stage. So as long as you're checking on a weekly basis, you should be okay dumping out that water and replenishing it. And if it's a bird bath, you probably want to do that anyway, because the birds would appreciate a clean uh, pool of water to wash with. In a in a small bird bath, um, how many larvae would we expect to see a female lay? Um, so it, it really depends on the species, but this can vary between, you know, 100 to as many as 500 eggs. Uh, it depends as well on the status of the animal, how many, uh, how large a blood meal. It is taken because the blood meal is actually going to be required for acquiring energy. Okay, the protein and amino acids that are acquired through the blood meal are going to be uh, utilized for actually producing eggs. Um, why do we itch when we get? Why do we itch? <laughs> well, we have we itch because we get an immune response and we have um, you know a reaction to the bite of the mosquito. Um, and, and like any bite, you're going to have an itch uh, to uh, respond to, and that causes that uh, itching sensation that we get. Uh, and, and a large degree depends on the immunity of the individual. Some individuals will have these large welts. You know, my son uh, tends to be one of these individuals that is uh, very sensitive to mosquito bites. He gets these very large welts when he gets a bite. Others have a small little uh, uh, swelling in and around the area of bite of the bite. It's also very dependent on the species that you actually get bitten by, right? Some, you know, will have a very small uh, swell around the bite. Others will actually lead to a much larger um, uh, wealth. And it, again, it's dependent on the individual that gets bitten. How exposed have they been to different variety of, of mosquitoes? I myself have been in my lab, you know, and probably bitten several dozen times every week because, you know, just the mosquitoes I work on, aren't readily found in, in Ontario and in Canada, but you know, they will um, escape from the cages where we house them and uh, can make their way and, and feed on us. We're the available hosts uh, available for them to, to feed upon.
they seem to sometimes be attracted to to more people than other people and and it always gets it comes down to i've heard people talk about um the type of blood they have or the colors they're wearing is is this true yeah so there's you know there's there's myths and there's facts um you know i've been contacted a few times whether you know uh, beer binging has any influence on uh, the attractiveness towards mosquitoes um you know, different mosquitoes utilize different cues to feed upon their hosts. Uh, you have some species that will feed on humans, others that will feed strictly on uh, birds, others that are less selective, and they might feed on both birds and, and humans. And those are the ones that are more important as uh, West Nile virus vectors, for example, because they can then transmit from a bird reservoir to a human. Uh, and that is what then leads to West Nile virus, if, if that particular mosquito has that pathogen. But um, the, the, the big story behind all of this is ultimately all mosquitoes utilize a, a subset of, of cues for finding a host. Um, these include carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is used for long-range host detection. Um, they have uh, sensory uh, appendages on their heads and in other regions of the body that can actually detect very small fluctuations in carbon dioxide within the environment, just over ambient. And, you know, typically humans, uh, when we're breathing normally, um, we emit about a four and a half to five percent uh, uh, CO2 level. OK, that's many fold higher than what ambient CO2 levels are in, in the air. And as that dilutes and moves away from from our bodies, mosquitoes can pick that up and actually they can pick it up as far as 50 to 100 feet away from the host. And so that acts as a, a long uh, range trajectory for them to initially find a host. And then they use other sensory modalities, uh, vision, as well as other um, olfactory cues, such as body odor, um, to detect and find their, their hosts. And so, you know, depending on the particular body odor of an individual, um, and these might not be the ones you would pick up, you know, you and I would pick up, but the subtle cues that are picked up by these animals, that might be more easily detectable by the mosquito, right? And, and so they can pick those up. There is some evidence in the literature that the, um, you had mentioned about the uh, clothing. There is some evidence that some of the uh, colors and clothing that individuals might wear might be advantageous. I think this is very dependent on uh, perhaps the species that we're talking about, because ultimately, really, uh, these mosquitoes don't have vision like you and I do. And so they're able to see a silhouette, uh, really. And, and so being able to differentiate the host from the background, if they're wearing a color that better allows them to differentiate that difference, it might make them more attractive to uh, to to be bitten. Interesting. Um, another question I have is about we we started talking about smells a little bit there. Um, shampoo, deodorant, eating garlic, those kind of things. Um, I have a buddy who won't shower or or wear deodorant when we're in the bush because he thinks it attracts the bugs, the smell. Um, does that work? And I have another friend who eats a ton of garlic before. Yeah, so I've I've heard I, I haven't seen any actual uh, articles uh, to support any of these claims. I've heard of these, and and of course social media <laughs> spreads of many of these claims like wildfire. Again, it comes down to uh, the odors that the animals are able to see, and if it's a particular odor that the mosquito is attracted to, then that's going to make you a prime target. Um, you know, if it means masking your, your normal orders to the animal, um, then, then that may, might make you a little bit better off. Uh, but certainly uh, there are some even natural things you can do. Like we know that there's like the citronella oils that um, uh, can be used in your backyard. And when my parents have a citronella plant is a more kind of natural way so you don't have to burn. Um, does it work? I think it's context specific there as well because I get bitten alive when I go to my parents in the backyard and that citronella plant does nothing for me. So, uh, you know, I think it really depends on uh, the species, uh, the context where we're talking about, you know, how many mosquitoes are there? Because, you know, if there's enough mosquitoes there, one of them is going to find you, right? And so uh, some of these things might work. Some of these kind of uh, makeshift uh, methodologies might work for some people. If it works, great, keep doing it. But um, I don't. I'm not aware of any uh, evidence in the literature to support it. Do you have any tips to prevent? What are you, What are your tips to prevent getting mosquito bites? What would you recommend? Um, one thing for sure, when you know going out for hikes with the kids and stuff, that they're wearing long clothes and uh, they're wearing their socks over their pants, long sleeve collars if possible. 
um, because, you know, you never know. And, and uh, a lot of it to do with as well uh, ticks, not only mosquitoes that we're worried about, but ticks as well. And, you know, having that extra layer of protection means, you know, kids get home, change your clothes, go, go in the shower, make sure that if there's anything loose on you. And it just avoids that potential uh, bite from either a mosquito or, you know, in the case of ticks, entering and, and, and uh, embedding themselves in your skin to feed on your blood. If we do have an itchy area, do you have any techniques to um, bring the itch out so it doesn't itch as much? Yeah, so um, they have the, uh, uh, like, calamine lotion works works quite well, and that's something that's been around for quite a long, uh, quite a long time. And I know that they have the anti-itch uh, creams as well. I think that's a a staple to have anytime you're going camping or uh, anywhere, uh, especially with when you have small kids, because kids, even though you tell them a million times, stop scratching, they'll just keep scratching until it bleeds, right? Um, I mean, there's some people that'll do, even adults that'll do that anyway, right? But um, yeah, that anti-itch uh, cream will work. Calamine, if you want to do something a little bit uh, uh, less that's been around for a little bit longer on the market. Um, but those types of things are, are staple products that everyone should have if they're uh, either going up to the cottage or just going out uh, for a camping trip or just even in their backyard. I think it's always useful to have those types of things around. When we do use bug spray and we and we spray it on, how does that work? How how does that repel the mosquitoes? So the uh, depends on the, the bug spray, uh, but many of them have the uh, chemical D. And, and that is a repellent uh, of uh, these uh, uh, mosquito species. Um, you spray it on open uh, areas of skin, right? You wouldn't really uh, want to soak it into areas that are unexposed, um, allowing it to absorb into your skin for a long period of time. But open areas of skin that are exposed to uh, the environment, uh, you would spray those. And they deter the, uh, they essentially are blocking. So they're acting as a, a, a uh, a blocker of the mosquitoes from feeding on on your arm, on your skin, on your leg, wherever you spray it. Um, and they're, you know, confusing the mosquito. So normally it's looking for those cues that we talked about earlier, those odorants, um, the heat cues, carbon dioxide. Um, and that kind of confuses the animal and makes them less likely to be able to find the host and, and feed on it because they're getting these negative signals that is kind of deterring them away from the host. Amazing. Jean-Paul, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. I really appreciate having you. Thanks so much for having me, Adam. And uh, hopefully uh, this uh, gives me a little more information when I'm around the campfire and people are asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Cottage Life is well known for offering our readers little tips and hacks that make life at the lake a little easier. In this episode of the podcast, we offer up some tips for keeping those buzzing mozzies at bay. Since mosquitoes lay their eggs near water, we often associate them with summer at the lake. But their favorite breeding grounds are actually small amounts of still water. That means the real springboards of mosquito season could be those sources of standing water at your cottage property. Now, to evict those unwanted guests, Watch out for anywhere water can pool. Tire swings, bird baths, and flower pots are all hot spots. So are folds in your barbecue cover, and not to mention any tarps that cover your cottage toys. Clogged eaves troughs are also another breeding ground, so keep those gutters free of debris. Mosquitoes also love compost piles, so if you're starting a new one, keep it away from the cottage. Let me tell you it's worth that extra walk. And if you keep your pet dishes outside your deck door, be sure to bring them in at night. The last thing you want is mosquitoes hatching right outside your cottage door. Of course, no cottage is ever totally free of unwanted guests. But if you keep an eye on standing water, you'll have fewer mosquitoes and more reason to embrace the outdoors. Hey, Cottage Coach Adam Holman here. Some cottage memories I want to keep forever, like the proud look on my son's face the first time he hooked a fish, or keeping him up late so he could see all the stars that we never see back in the city. But if I could forget one thing about the cottage, it would be the swarms of mosquitoes. 
And that's tough to do when you're covered in itchy reminders of every second you spent in shorts. So, to make sure my family and I remember the good stuff, we never forget to use Off Family Care. It repels mosquitoes for up to five hours, and it goes on as a smooth powder instead of an oily, greasy film. So now, I can remember the good stuff and forget the mosquitoes. <laughs> We're closing off this bonus episode of the podcast with an essay written by one of our favorite writers. In this essay, Roy McGregor answers a question we're certain every cottager has considered at one time or another. From our September-October 2004 issue, here's Biting the Big One, read by Pedro Mendez. We are entering the second lull. It happens but twice a year, and in a subtle way, poses the question as to how Canadians can stand the rest of the year. It is when the weather is absolutely lovely, the sun warm and the air soft, and there is not a bug to be seen. I took note of this phenomenon in the early spring, when, during a week off at the lake, I discovered there exists a magical time, however brief, when the sun is out but the leaves are not, when the ice has vanished but the black flies have yet to appear. A very rough description might be heaven on earth. It is about to happen again. The bugs have mostly died off, and autumn can be the most wonderful time of the year to be at the cottage. A time when it is possible to dance in the high grass and weeds back of the outhouse and not be swarmed by a single thing but seed. It has been said this year that the black flies were the worst ever, then that the mosquitoes were the worst ever almost as if this precious lakeshore property had suddenly become a combination dung heap, garbage dump, and slaughterhouse. And so, at the end of a summer in which Canadians decided who was the worst political party, I am left trying to determine which, in fact, is the worst bug. Let us then begin the 2004 Cottage Country Bug Off. The Black Fly has the distinct advantage, from its point of view, of being the first bug to follow winter the one, essentially, that ruins everything. It's too small to see accurately, and its swarm is too thick to destroy completely. It can crawl into holes you did not even know your body has. Its bite is worse in the scratching, and the chomps sometimes become infected, especially in the scalps of small children. Black flies have been known to drive moose into traffic and early explorers, as well as early gardeners, insane. Their sole positive feature is that one day in the late spring, they suddenly and mysteriously vanish. The mosquito. This country's true national symbol. Its sting is so sharp that humans have been known to injure themselves slapping back. Its most annoying attribute, however, is sound. Sound growing and sound suddenly stopping. Landing location unknown. Since the arrival of the West Nile virus, cottagers can only shake their heads at the radio ads suggesting mosquitoes be avoided and standing water eliminated, this bug's annoyance level has taken a quantum leap. The ankle biter, also known as the stable fly. They look like small house flies but appear only around bare ankles in canoes and boats. Their bite is roughly equivalent to a match bursting into flame just beneath your skin. Panicked swatting in a canoe makes them doubly dangerous. The deer fly. If you were a dog with floppy ears, this would be no contest. The bite of the deer fly is roughly the equivalent of dropping a running chainsaw on your fleshy parts. It alone knows the secret passage that leads below your baseball cap. Mercifully, it is the fly with the lowest IQ, meaning you can usually pluck one out of your hair and squeeze it as slowly as as revenge requires. The horsefly. The swimmer's curse. Its bite is the insect world's answer to the great white shark. One does not get bitten by a horsefly as much as kicked. The one saving grace is that, like cottage country bargains, there are not many of them. We must, therefore, now declare a winner in the 2004 cottage country bug-off. It is, of course, the one that just landed on you.
Well, that's it for this special branded episode of the Cottage Life Podcast presented by Off. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe to the Cottage Life Podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. We'll have new episodes every Thursday throughout the summer, just in time for your drive up to the cottage. We'd love to hear from you. Post a review or email us at edit at cottagelife.com. To find out more about our magazine, our television shows, and our live events, visit cottagelife.com. This podcast is produced by Catherine Jun and Michelle Kelly. I'm Adam Holden. I'll see you on the dock. <laughs>